Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to navigating the college admissions process. Before we get started, there are a couple of things I'd like to go over. This is the third webinar in this series about college readiness for high school students and their parents. There are five different webinars in this series, which we will preview for you in just a second, but you can also check out our social to learn more and register for those. The presentation that we're giving today will be recorded. The recording as well as some of informa information from other webinars that we have coming up will be available in our follow-up email that you are going to receive in the next couple of days. Additionally, there will be a Q&A at the end of this session. So if you have any questions that come up throughout the webinar, please feel free to drop those questions in the question box. I can review and answer those as we go possibly, or I'll just save them for the end and let the experts review them. So with all of that said, thank you so much for joining this Cram for High Schoolers webinar on navigating college admissions. Once again, this is being recorded. I am Amy Dietzman, and I lead the training and professional development team at Tutor.com, and I will be presenting just a little bit at the beginning here, but then I'm also going to be your moderator for today. I'm joined by our experts, Henry Price and Rachel Ekman. So without any further ado, I'm going to get us started. Whoops, we want to make sure we see those people fly. All right. So... In our last webinar, we discussed navigating the college decision and thinking about if college is right for you. In this webinar, we suspect most of you have determined that you are interested in some kind of further education, but perhaps you just aren't quite sure yet exactly what you want to do or where you want to go. So stick with us as we go through some options with you. And then next week, if you're interested, we have navigating financial literacy for college. This is really important. All the things you need to think about when it comes to finances and paying for college. And then at, at the, our last one will be two weeks from then, which is navigating life during and after college. That's our series. So let's get started. Today, we're going to talk about how you plan for the application process how you understand the typical college application. We're going to research just a little bit, just barely touch on some financial options for college. Like I said, next week is gonna be a really in-depth uh, webinar about financial options, but we do need to talk about it a little bit when we're talking about college admissions, so we will. And then we're gonna explore technical, community, and four-year college choices. So. You may not know which one you're interested in, or you may be on here and you know exactly what you want to do, but we're going to touch all of them. So stick with us because there's going to be a little bit for everybody here. As we go through this presentation today, Henry, Rachel, and I are going to share with you our own educational backgrounds so that you can know a little bit more about what our experiences looked like and maybe a little more about how we navigated our college journeys. So I had the very traditional college experience right out of high school. I moved out. I moved to California. I lived in the dorm with a roommate that I never met. I got involved in music, theater, and dance, and I had a great first year. For some reason, I can't really explain, I decided to transfer after that. And I ended up living back in my hometown, Phoenix, Arizona at that time, uh, in my own apartment. I commuted to school. I worked full time and then mostly supported myself through the next three years while I finished my degree. After getting married and having two kids, I discovered my degree was not going to help me get into the field that I really wanted to be in. So after I researched and I talked with an enrollment advisor, I determined that a master's in education was what I needed to become a teacher. So I went back to school full time with two small children and earned an online degree and a teaching job. Not long into my teaching tenure, I realized I wanted to be a teacher leader. And that required more education. So I researched and I decided that to reach the highest potential position, I needed a doctoral degree. So I enrolled yet again in a mostly online program with some in-person week-long intensive courses while working full-time and being a full-time wife and mother. Now this was exhausting and it required way more discipline and commitment than I ever knew I had, but I did it. 
anybody can find a place in higher education. As I just told you, I went into higher education at all different times in my life. In just a bit, we're going to discuss a lot of different options for me, for you, aside from the traditional four-year university that you might be thinking about. But if the four-year school is something you're considering, here are a few things you should know about college that might dispel some of the myths that you may have heard. Often we hear about Ivy League colleges in the news. Those schools get a lot of attention and admissions into those colleges is very competitive. Ivy League schools are very unique. And maybe you are in, on this call are interested in an Ivy League school, but most of us aren't. But I will say most colleges accept 50% or more of those who apply. In fact, many fully online colleges have something called open enrollment, which means that they accept everyone. This doesn't mean that their programs aren't still rigorous and valuable. It just means that they give everyone an opportunity to be successful regardless of their background. If you are concerned about an online school and if it's any good, you wanna make sure you check into their accreditation. Also, non-traditional college students make up almost 75% of the students enrolled in higher education, which means these are students who have jobs, families, maybe they don't necessarily live on campus, they attend distance programs or online classes, maybe they just go to school part-time. This is also a large population of adult learners. So non-traditional isn't really non-traditional anymore. And when I say adult learners, I know if you're 18, you're considered an adult, but I'm talking like 25 and up. And lastly, we hear all the time about how the cost of college has increased exponentially over the past decade or two. And that is true but so has the percentage of students who earn scholarships. So don't be too intimidated by what you hear. We wanna encourage you on this call today to go for what you want and have as many options as possible and then decide what's best. So what are colleges and universities looking for in a student? First off, they want students who are well-rounded. Can you demonstrate in your application that you have a mix of interests and skills? Can you show that your grades are trending up? Maybe you slacked off a little bit your freshman year, but did you work harder as the years went on, showing maturity and a commitment to your education? Schools want students who are interested in some curricular activities. They know that students will be more successful if they get involved. So does it appear that you will be active in the college community, but not too much? They also know that students who are too active in extracurriculars may not focus on their studies. And those who don't focus on their studies, well, they aren't gonna be successful. And then what is it that makes you unique and how will you contribute to the life of the campus? That's the answer to what colleges are looking for in college admissions essays. University applicants who demonstrate the following qualities of a good college student have more to contribute to the school. Do you have leadership skills? Are you willing to take risks? Does it appear that you can take initiative? Do you have a sense of social responsibility and a commitment to service? And lastly, do you have any special talents or abilities? One thing I wanna point out about uniqueness in essays, keep in mind, everyone your age was impacted by the pandemic. And many students over the past few years have chosen to write about that in their college admissions essays. So it's not really that unique. So if you're relying on your essay and your essays about struggles you had through the pandemic or any kind of struggle, maybe your parents getting divorced or you moved across the country in the middle of high school, whatever it might be, these things can still be great just to make sure that you stand out. You want to write them well and also be careful of writing anything that's too overly personal or incredibly sensitive. And Henry's going to talk more about college admissions essays in just a little bit. Overall, colleges want a mix of students to create a rich campus community. They want the class valedictorians, 
However, they are also looking for students who are going to be involved in a lot of activities and students who are musicians and athletes and everything in between. So now I'm going to pass it over to Henry and he can share more about the college admissions process and himself. Hi, thanks, Amy. And again, welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here today. Much like Amy, I started off as a fairly traditional uh, college student. I went straight out of high school and I finished in four years with a degree in music. I'm a little bit less traditional, maybe, in that I didn't do anything with that music degree, musically anyway. I didn't go into that field. In fact, I stayed at my alma mater for a while as an employee. And I figured I'd get a master's while I was there because I got a pretty substantial tuition discount. It turns out that degree was the one that led me more or less where I am today. It was, an, it was a master's in educational technology. And here I am working for PrincetonReviewTutor.com doing educational technology. So you just never know the direction you'll go and where it will take you. So my first um, topic to talk to you about today is the college application process. And you're probably thinking, yeah, I know what that is. I mean, it's telling colleges about stuff you've been doing and it's a whole lot of work. Well, you're right, but there's value in doing that work well. So I want to talk a little bit about how to not just view the application as a task you have to complete, it is, but it's also an opportunity to improve your chances of getting admission to the school of your choice, as well as potentially scholarships. Well, first things first, you're right to say that the college application is a lot of work and a time-consuming puzzle with a lot of pieces. And like a lot of other big, scary puzzles, it can be difficult to imagine what the finished product is going to look like if you're still at the point of trying to understand what the pieces even are. So let's unpack that puzzle just a little bit. As you probably know, the main thing college admissions committees are looking for is what you've been doing as a high school student. That more or less breaks into these two categories, your academics and your extracurricular activities. If you're a junior right now heading into senior year next fall, your academics are pretty well in place by now and colleges are gonna evaluate them by looking at your transcripts. A transcript is a physical or digital record of what classes you've taken in high school and how you did in those classes. Selective colleges, those are the ones Amy talked about that are selecting fewer than half of their applicants. They're also going to want to look at how much you challenge yourself as well. So if you took a lot of AP classes or dual credit or international baccalaureate or just honors classes, they will generally look at those a little more favorably than your standard high school courses. But that doesn't mean you have to have a bunch of advanced courses on your transcript or that you have to have aced them in order to get in. Think of your transcript as a straightforward record of how you performed in high school. It doesn't tell them anything about how or why you got there. You will have a ch chance to tell them about those things, which we'll talk about in a bit. If you're listening to this and you're an underclassman, you still have a chance to talk to your advisors and counselors about how to sign up for some of those more advanced challenging courses that colleges like to see if you would like to do that. The other part of your high school life takes place outside of class, and we'll talk, we'll refer to those as your extracurriculars, which, hey, is literally Latin for outside of class. I agree with everything Amy said, and one of the business, the biggest mistakes I've seen applicants make is that they don't give themselves enough credit for all the things they've been doing. It's unlikely if you're the class president or an Eagle Scout, that this would slip your mind while filling out your college application. But there's a good chance that you have been doing all kinds of things outside the classroom that colleges would be impressed by, and you may not even realize. So if you've volunteered, if you've been active in your faith community, if you played in a school band or been in theater productions or played on school or club sports teams, really anything, whether it took up a good chunk of your time for four years or just consisted of a few hours one afternoon, make sure to record all of it with special emphasis on any and all leadership roles you took on during those activities. And if you're thinking, well, I would have done that, but I had to take a paying job to support my family, you'll have the chance to put that on your application too. And colleges understand that this prevented you from dabbling in all these different social activities. And if you're thinking, well, I actually couldn't do any of that because I'm the primary caretaker for my younger siblings and I basically have no life at all. Colleges not only understand that, they're impressed by that. 
So you should record that too. There's a place on your application to say all of that. Now, as I said earlier, the biggest mistake people make is not giving themselves credit for all of that. So where and how do you record all of this? Well, we'll talk about the standard application websites in just a second, but I strongly advise that you start now, whatever now is for you, whatever grade level you're in, start now keeping a file of these things and writing them down as they happen. It can be a digital file, of course. Or if you know there's a bunch of stuff you've already completed, then set aside time to reflect and make that file now so you have all those ducks in a row before you sit down to fill out the application in the fall. Now, back to the application itself. Second to your grades, at most colleges anyway, are your test scores. The number of schools who actually don't require them is growing, which we'll get into in a bit. If you were able to attend our CRAM 1 session earlier this month, you probably heard a lot about SAT and ACT. Today, I just want to talk about how they fit into your application. If a school requires you to take one of these tests, you obviously should take it. And if you already have, great. Don't forget, you can always retake it if you think you can beat your score. Colleges will let you know whether they require SAT or ACT scores. And one thing to note is I said, or not and. If you've taken one, either the SAT or the ACT, you do not have to take the other unless you think you would do better on it or just want to find out. Every school that accepts one would also accept the other. Which one you take is usually more a function of where you grew up and what the more popular test is there. But even the colleges in your area who are used to seeing one would accept the other. So some schools will list test scores as optional. You're welcome to submit them if you think they help your profile, but you don't have to. So if you have not yet taken the SAT or ACT and you're feeling the time crunch, or if you feel the scores wouldn't help you because you did take it and you didn't love your score, you don't have to submit the scores to those schools. And yes, there are some universities, most notably the entire public school system in, in the state of California. That's the University of California schools and the Cal State schools now are officially test blind in their admissions policy. That means they won't consider SAT or ACT scores even if you do submit them. So do your research. Determine which schools that you might be interested in are in which of these categories, requiring them or optional or blind, but also keep in mind that these rules keep changing. So check more than once. If you're not applying this month, then you, what you find out this month about a particular school's admission policy may be different by the time you're actually applying. So be careful and check more than once. When it comes to SAT and ACT, if there's any doubt about where you're applying or whether they're gonna take it, you might as well go ahead and take the test and worry later about whether, whether to submit it. Now, I do wanna say real quick, no discussion about the current state of college admissions testing would be complete without talking about the fact that the SAT is going digital next year. So if you are currently a junior or senior, don't worry about this. But if you are in the class of 2025 or beyond, you will probably find yourself just with the opportunity to take the SAT entirely on a computer screen starting in about a year, March of 2024. Whether this is good news or bad news depends on a lot of things. Most of them are just your own personal preferences. But be aware that this test this fall is going to be very different from the one next spring. So make sure that any pre preparation you're doing to take the SAT is preparing you for the right test. Princeton Review's YouTube channel is actually a great resource for updates on all of this. So check it out from time to time. See what's new. In addition to the high school experience and your test scores, letters of recommendation are another key part of the application and maybe the almost overlooked part. So I want to dive into this a little bit more. When requesting letters of recommendation, you've got two jobs. First things first, identify who's going to write your recommendations. Here are some things to consider. How many letters are you going to need? And are there any rules around who can submit them? Do they, does one of them have to come from one of your core academic instructors or something like that? Read closely in the application. Who has good and unique things to say about you? The job of a letter of recommendation is the same as the job of an essay and every other aspect of your application. It needs to add value to your application. 
So the person recommending you needs to be able to say more than, yes, this person passed my English class and, you know, was a good student. That's not giving me anything I didn't already know if I'm the college admissions officer. So take a look, think about it. Who is going to be able to say things about you that I would not know about you from the rest of the application? And yeah, let's be honest. Is that person reliable? If you ask them to submit a letter of recommendation, will they do it and will they do it on time? Which leads me to my next point. When are they due? Let that person know. That should be listed on the application itself. Just make sure you pass that information along to your recommender. The second thing that's so important when selecting people to, to write your letters of recommendation is to make their job as easy as possible. This is common courtesy, of course, but it's in your best interests if you want the recommendation to be as good as it can be. To accomplish this, I would approach them formally. Look, if you wave at them in a passing period from the outside of their classroom and say, hey, can you write me a college rec? Chances are they will, because teachers are just like that. They overachieve, and that's great. But if you want them to write the best possible recommendation, you want them to think about this a little more than that, right? So approach them formally. If you're not in the same building as them on a regular basis, sending them an email is acceptable. Calling them on the phone, of course, is fine. Just make sure that you're making a request beyond just sort of nudging them, right? It'd be, be polite and respectful about it. Secondly, give them lots of lead time. I talked earlier about, about due dates. Make sure that whatever that due date is, you give them more than a couple of days to write this thing. Chances are they probably churn out college recommendations every year, but if you want yours to be unique, give them enough time to reflect on their relationship with you and what they would like to say about you. And in order to accomplish that, a really cool idea is to provide them a written outline of the achievements and characteristics that you'd like them to highlight. Now look, I'm saying an outline, not tell them exactly what to say, right? But list some things that they already know about you that they might feel inclined to include. That is a great way to guide them without pushing them. So again, for letters of recommendation, make their job as easy as possible because ultimately it's you who bit the benefit of that. The last piece to the puzzle is the application itself. This seems like a formality or even busy work, but did you know that a well-constructed application can mean the difference between standing out and getting lost in the shuffle? The great news is that no matter how many colleges you apply to, you will probably not have to fill out all the same information about yourself every time because most U.S. applications, most U.S. colleges accept the common app. The website's listed here. Its job is to let you know all the information about yourself that's attach your transcripts, list your extracurriculars, lay out all the cool stuff you've accomplished, and then you can submit it to however many colleges you want. Now, keep in mind, not every school accepts the Common App, and there are usually a few extra steps for each school, and most applications actually have a fee attached. So I don't literally mean apply to everything, everywhere, all at once. Great movie. But the most boring parts, you can probably knock out all at once. Quick note, if you're applying to a school in Texas, note that means the college, not your personal home is in Texas like mine is. Well, we like to put the Texas brand on things. So you'll want to do all the same stuff I just said at a different site called applytexas.org. That link's also on the screen. The same principles apply as for the Common App, but they go specifically for schools in Texas. Of course, you should also visit the websites of every school you're considering. They'll tell you, do we accept the Common App, the Apply Texas application? Neither. Do you want to do it on our site? If you want, you can apply on their site. But remember, you may have to do this over and over again if you go that route. So I would recommend using the Common App at Apply Texas as much as you possibly can. The other thing you'll find within the Common App or Apply Texas or on the university site is whether essays are required and what prompts you'll be expected to answer, how many words are required and so on. Essays can feel like a burden, but remember, it's another way to convey something unique about you. Keep in mind the admissions officer already knows your grades, your scores, your activities, they're reviewing your recommendations. So in your essay, ask yourself, what else can I communicate that they wouldn't already know? 
The prompts doesn't end up mattering nearly as much as that goal. Make yourself look good one more time. So ask yourself, are they required? And then think about what the ultimate goal is, what it's trying to accomplish, which is to say something special and unique about yourself. Just like with recommendations, give yourself a long runway to write these essays. Get some help proofreading and editing. Write multiple drafts. Make sure the one that you end up submitting is the absolute best that you can write. I know that's a lot, but if you have a plan of attack, you can put all these pieces together and give yourself the best chance to get admissions and scholarships. Ah, I love this. Isn't it satisfying? And now with some thoughts on how many options you have when it comes to the next step after high school, I'm going to hand it over to Rachel. Thanks, Henry. Hey, everyone. As far as college tracks go, I definitely took the scenic route. <laughs> I first started my college experience when I was fresh out of high school. I went to community college and I was working full time. Over the next 21 years, I dropped out of school, started again a few different times. I joined the military. I deployed three times. I moved a lot. <laughs> when it was all said and done, I had attended two community colleges, a technical college, and two universities, and I had both an associate's and a bachelor's degree. But I've also been accepted into several master's programs, and so there's a chance I'll go back to school any minute now. Who knows? Now, I'm not suggesting all the dropping out and starting and stopping, but if there are any of you out there listening who are just not sure what you want to do after high school, I want you to know that it's okay to not be sure. You don't have to be sure yet. And it's also okay to misstep, to change course, and to reroute. When the conversations about college start, there's a lot of talk about traditional four-year colleges, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. If you want and are able to attend a four-year college or university and go straight from high school into getting a bachelor's degree or beyond, that's outstanding. But it's not the only college path. And as someone who benefited tremendously from taking some of the less traditional ones, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of your other options. Because when it comes to your education, you can't have too many options, right? Community college is a fantastic way to start college. The admissions process is much simpler. All you need to do is complete the relatively simple application, which is more informational than anything else, and get your student loans or financing options ready. A lot of people think that the only ways to complete high school are by staying in until you earn your diploma or getting a GED. But if you haven't quite earned all the credits you need to complete high school, you may be eligible to take non-matriculated courses at community college for dual credit. Through that program, not only are you earning college credits, but you'll also be able to earn your diploma. And once you get that diploma, the college credits you've earned will roll right into your degree program. A lot of states also have incentives like the Commonwealth Commitment in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, if you start at a Massachusetts community college and maintain their minimum grade and attendance requirements, you get automatic acceptance into your state school of choice to go for your bachelor's degree. And in the state of New York, there are programs like the SUNY Apprenticeship Program that will put you on track for basically near instant job placement after graduation. There are a lot of different options and incentives when it comes to community college, so don't be afraid to ask questions about that and start with the most important question, which is, is community college the right choice for you? There are a lot of reasons community college may be a great place for you to start. Maybe you have family obligations that prevent you from leaving home, and Henry kind of touched on family obligations a little earlier. If there are people who are counting on you for financial support or contribution, you may need to keep working at the job you have now. Or maybe the job you have now already has you on the career path you want and you don't want to leave it. Maybe your grades aren't as great as you'd like and you realize you won't likely be accepted into your college of choice at the moment. Or maybe you're just unsure. If you don't know what you'd want to major in or what career path you want, then a four-year college may not be the right choice yet. And of course, there's always concern about tuition costs and student loans. So let's unpack some of that and see how starting at community college could help you resolve some of these concerns. If you're working or planning to work while you're in school, 
They have wonderful amount of flexibility in scheduling that is very useful for a working student. You'll have the opportunity to take night classes, weekend classes, even hybrid or online classes so you can maintain your work schedule while also going to college full time. Community college is also a priceless opportunity to boost your grades. If you have a first choice school, but you don't think you'll get in because of your grades and your high school transcripts, yeah, there's the option to go to a second choice school or a safety school, but there's also the option to start at a community college. When you have a strong GPA and performance records and community, those transcripts speak volumes about your ability to thrive in a higher education environment. And community college affords you the opportunity to sit down with career counselors who can help you as an adult to select a career path that's right for you. Sometimes within the halls of high school under the watchful eye of the same parents, teachers, and counselors, it can be hard to even have that conversation and see yourself as an autonomous adult in the workplace. Once you get to college, you start with a clean slate. This is where your professional journey really begins. And the career counselors at community college are a wonderful resource for information and guidance as you go through that process. Now let's talk tuition. Around a third of all college students cite tuition as their primary concern when it comes to choosing college. Community colleges are exponentially cheaper than four-year colleges and universities with a national average cost of just $3,588. And since you can apply your earned credits toward your bachelor's degree in less time, it makes your four-year degree exponentially cheaper as well. I'll give you this Texas example since I happen to live in Texas. The average in-state community college tuition here is about $2,300 a year. That means if I finish my associates in two years, it'll have roughly cost me $4,600. Now I want a bachelor's degree, and at UTEP for a Texas resident, the annual tuition is about $8,600 a year. I transfer my associate's degree and hopefully start as a junior at UTEP. It takes me two more years, and now the total cost of my education was $21,800, and I have two degrees. Basically, because I started at community, I've got two degrees for half the price. So if tuition and student loans are a concern for you at all, community college should most definitely be on your radar as a possible jumping off point. One of the mistakes I made when I first started going to community was that I treated it just like high school. But then unlike high school, there's this lack of oversight that can really get away from you if you let it. And that's not just true for community college. That's really all colleges. So if there's one really important piece of advice I can give you, it's this. Take ownership of your educational experience wherever you end up. Don't go to class just because you don't want to be marked absent. Because the truth is, in college, nobody really cares if you're absent. They'll just let you skip class right up until the day you get dropped, and then they'll still charge you for it. <laughs> So go to class because you know it's important. Do the work because you know it has value and study because you know the effort you put in here is going to pay you back tenfold down the road. When it comes to career placement, you really can't be technical colleges. The admissions process is much, much simpler. They typically only require proof of completion from your high school. So either your GED or your diploma, no transcripts are usually necessary. Sometimes there will be a questionnaire or entry exam, and those are typically just to ensure that the applicant is choosing a field that they'll be able to succeed in. But for the most part, if you decide a technical college is where you want to be, you'll have plenty of options to choose from, and you can really write your own ticket. By the time you graduate high school, you've spent most of your life, around 12 or 13 years, in a traditional classroom. And for some of us, that is plenty at least for now. <laughs> so if you're itching to get out of the classroom and into a more hands-on real world learning environment where you learn by doing, then technical colleges were made for you. Similarly to community colleges, you'll also have much smaller class sizes and flexible scheduling. Technical colleges offer a wide variety of program choices across many technical fields, and you can often earn your certifications and associate's degree in much less time than at a traditional school. Classroom engagement is fantastic in technical college. You're almost never just sitting there being lectured to. There are labs and skills assessments and hands-on practice. It is genuinely experiential education. 
Technical colleges sort of fall in that in-between financial zone. So they're usually more than community college, but less expensive than a four-year college. And though the costs and specifics vary quite a bit by institution and by program, of course, typically the tuition at a technical college includes all the books, uniforms, tools, and equipment you'll need while you're a student, if not also for when you join the workforce. When I was teaching at a technical college, our students graduated with all the tools they'd need to enter the workforce. Master tool sets, welding equipment, HVAC tools, test sets, you name it. Plus, we had an on-campus store where they could buy additional specialty items at an incredibly steep student discount. There are all kinds of potential perks at a technical college. One of the things I always used to tell my students was to get a job working in fields during school. That way, when it came time for them to do their internship, which would normally be unpaid, they'd be able to do their internship at their place of work and be getting paid for it. And that holds true for pretty much any college and any type of employment that you plan to seek once you've graduated college. Not to mention that by the time you graduate, instead of applying for a job, you're now negotiating a raise. Ask about exams to test out of classes. When I was attending technical college myself, I was a military veteran and an aviation mechanic. They ended up waiving nearly half my tuition because I tested out of basically every core class that they had. And another great thing to keep in mind about technical college is that it's not the end. Don't see it or any college experience as a choice between one career path or another. Beginning your career with technical training and real world, real world experience can open doors you may not have even imagined. Before Tina Turner was Tina Turner, she was a nurse who graduated from a technical college. Bob Marley used the money he made working at a Chrysler plant to start his record label. And Don Schumacher started out building transformers for his dad's company, and look how that turned out. So technical colleges can open up a world of possibilities. Don't think just because it's community college and it's cheaper, just because it's technical college, that there's less financial assistance available. The truth is community college scholarships account for around 25% of all college scholarships. Every year, community college students receive around $800 million in scholarship money for college and technical colleges as well. And if your plan is to eventually transfer from community college to a four-year school, there are scholarships specifically for transfer students also. Technical colleges also have their whole own world of scholarships available. Many of them come straight from the employers that are in need of skilled workers. The technical world is an absolute gold mine for scholarships, grants, and student loan repayment plans from employers. And it's not just the direct employers. For example, in the automotive industry, very often products companies, conventions, and organizations will sponsor technical students. You can get scholarships for automotive school from SEMA, SAE, the Automotive Women's Alliance, even tool brands and vendors like DeWalt and Pep Boys. Bottom line is, if you're unsure about a four-year school or if you're thinking about just stopping after high school, before you make any major decisions, Explore all your options because like Amy said earlier, there really is a place for everyone in education and yours may be hiding where you least expect it. And Henry is going to give you a lot more information about scholarships and student loans right now. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. It's me again, and I do want to speak real quick about the types of financial aid that you're going to want to look for. There is a whole session on financial aid coming up next week, so I'm going to let that team give you most of the details. But for now, let's set the stage by talking about the categories of aid available. That's grants and loans and scholarships. The main thing to know about grants and loans is that they are need-based. That is, you don't have to earn them you need to prove that you need them. The way that this is calculated is, well, way too complicated to get into right now, but the main source of grants and loans is the US government. Now states and other entities do chip in too, and you won't be eligible for any of it unless you complete the FAFSA. The two links popping up on the screen now will get you started down the path to free money. Again, you're gonna learn a lot more about this next week. And then there are scholarships. 
scholarships, unlike grants and loans, are merit-based. And yes, in this case, that means you do have to earn them. Colleges and universities themselves are by far the biggest source of scholarships. You might hear a lot about athletic scholarships or scholarships for specific talents like music or dance. All of that is fantastic if you can get it. But many scholarships are based on your grades, test scores, interests, and willingness to jump through a couple of hoops to apply for them. So if all that sounds familiar, yes, scholarships are based on a lot of the same things that your original admissions criteria were based on. Now, keep in mind, colleges are not alone here. Employers, nonprofit organizations, and other special committees award scholarships all the time. Some of them go unclaimed because not enough people apply. So go claim them. On the screen now are some websites that list available scholarships that come from organizations other than the schools you may be applying to. Visit these and give them information about yourself so they can help you find matches. A couple thoughts here. I wouldn't just apply for what I like to call the name in the hat scholarships. That is relatively small awards that really just require you to give your contact information or sign up for something. Hey, feel free to do these, but since everyone will be doing them, the odds of getting them are low and so are the dollar value. I wouldn't get too caught up in the dazzling mega scholarships that promise to pay your full load either on the opposite end of the spectrum. Look, these exist, and if they do seem attainable, then absolutely pursue them. But they tend to require an enormous amount of work. I, I really did once have a student ask if they should apply for a scholarship that would have required them to make a full-length documentary film about their lives, professionally produced. I'm like, can you do that? Um, since these scholarships are so huge, not only are they a lot of work, the competition for them will be fierce. So take the Goldilocks approach. Look for the scholarships that are not just the name in the hat ones or the really ridiculously high ones. Apply for the ones that might seem unappealing to other applicants. Maybe they're just, I put just in quotes, a few thousand dollars, which looks like a tiny fraction of your overall cost of attendance. And they require an essay that you have to spend a whole day putting together in order to get it. But think about that. You're going to get a few thousand dollars for one day's work? That's the best pay rate you might ever get in your entire life. And the chances of getting them aren't that bad because a lot of people are ignoring those opportunities because of the additional work that it would take and the fact that it doesn't look like a big amount of money. If you can nab just one of these, that'll help you pay for a couple of classes. And if you can get a few of them, suddenly that turns into maybe $10,000, $20,000. And that really can make the difference between being able to attend the school you want or not. All right, now I'm gonna hand it back to Rachel for some final thoughts about choosing the right coursework once you're there. Thank you again, Henry. So I just wanna wrap up with a few final thoughts because in higher education, the lackadaisical attitude we tend to have about electives is really pretty tragic. You wouldn't go into a store with $100 to spend and only buy $75 worth of things you actually really need and then spend the rest on some random stuff that just happens to be available and easy to reach. Why would you spend 25% of your money on things you don't really care about or want? Well, taking a bunch of random electives without pulling, putting any serious thought into them is doing exactly that with a lot more than $25 on my dad. The electives you choose can become an important part of relevant coursework that boosts your resume later on. Specialized training will give you a competitive edge in the job market. So consider what your career goals are and what special skills might come in handy. If you plan to take a career where you'll need to do a lot of presentations, consider taking a public speaking class. If your career will require you to manage people, take a psychology course. If you'll need to do a lot of interactions via written and oral communication, take a communications class. You have the opportunity to take your electives to another level, and they can really become a powerful tool for you to enhance not just your college experience, but your career progression, progression as well. So choose wisely. 
one of the biggest worries I think people have when starting school is trying to prepare for the workload. How much time will school really take? Well, there are a lot of factors. According to federal guidelines, one college credit hour reasonably approximates one hour of classroom learning plus two hours of independent work. That means for the average three credit course, you can expect to spend around three hours in the classroom and about six hours studying or doing homework each week for each class. That may sound like a lot, especially when you start multiplying that times three or four classes each semester if you're going to go full time. So it's really a good idea to just wait a little before planning a ton of extracurricular activities or committing to a, a difficult to change work schedule. Plan to give yourself a little bit of breathing room to feel out your new schedule and see what your bandwidth will be. Most importantly, don't be daunted by the prospect of starting school. Just ask questions, use the resources that are available to you, and remember that your education is in your hands. I will leave you with one of my favorite quotes from Albert Einstein. Wisdom is not a product of schooling, but of the lifelong attempt to mm. acquire it. So we wish you all the very best in your journey to acquire your wisdom. Thank you so much, Henry and Rachel. That was awesome. So just want to remind everybody that we have two more webinars coming up in this series, the financial literacy one we keep talking about next week, and then the following week, navigating life during and after college. So we're going to be coming up to those, but I want to open it up for questions now. And I also just put up our social media accounts up there so you can follow us and see other things that we might be up to. We do a lot of webinars. So opening it up for questions, please just type your question in that Q&A box if you have anything, and I'd be happy to throw it out to our experts. I've got a couple first that came in while we were listening to you speak, and I think this one was for you, Henry. Are there any advantages to not using the Common App? I think they mean if you were going to go on the actual school's website and fill out the application there. Is there any advantage to that? I imagine that would vary school to school. Um, if they accept the Common App, they're not going to think any less of you for using it. Um, if you think there's a lot of unique stuff, then it might make a lot of sense. And here's what I mean. If you go to the Common App, yes, like I said, the core kind of boring part where you put together a list of all of your academic achievements and so on, that's going to go anywhere you apply. But then within the Common App, you maybe you click on the university you're most interested in and you find out, well, there's actually like three essay prompts and four or five other like really specific things they ask for. And that's the main college you plan to apply to. It probably isn't all that different to just do it on their website. Uh, but no, I don't think there's any disadvantage to using the Common App. Um, it saves you a little bit of time if you're going to apply multiple places. And by the way, I recommend you apply multiple places. You should never put all your eggs in one basket, no matter how likely it feels that you're going to be admitted there. And on the flip side, you should apply to more than one school because you might get into a school that you didn't expect to get into, so it's worth a shot. Um, but it, no, I don't think there's any real disadvantage to using the Common App, but again, check your websites, make sure they first accept it, and second, how many additional hoops they want you to jump through before you make a final decision. Henry, you actually answered sort of, started to answer another question we had, which is there a rule of thumb for how many colleges you should apply to? Rachel might have a different um, feel for this. I like to think of it as categories of schools. So mm. you should you should apply to, I won't put an exact number on it, but a few schools that you are very confident you'll be admitted to. Even some community colleges, the ones that you're you know, almost certain to, to get into, because you want to make sure you have a plan, right? Um, you should also apply to some schools that are like the perfect fit for you. And in this session, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about how to do that. In the prior session, we, we did a little more of that. Um, but, you know, do they have the major that you're looking for? Or is it in the kind of location you'd like to spend the next four years? And even crazy stuff like, what are the dorms like? Is the food any good? Uh, Princeton Review mm. has really cool lists of like all the best stuff, all the all the colleges that have the best 
whatever you might care about, um, which is a fun, a fun um, rabbit hole to go down. Um, so apply to a few schools that are like the perfect match for you personally, whatever that means for you. And then also apply to some schools, like I said a second ago, you're not even 100% sure you would even strongly be considered for because you never know. And the other thing mm-hmm. I want to say is don't, don't hesitate to apply because of the price tag. Because if it turns out that that school is too expensive for you, then you don't have to go there because you applied to multiple schools. You have other options. But after scholarships are awarded, you'd be surprised how much less of a difference there is between the expensive school and the right. and what looks like the less expensive school. The short answer to that question <laughs> would be, I like to think of it as like the rule of three. Three, what I would consider schools I'm likely to get into. Three schools that I feel like would be the perfect match for me and three schools that I'm not sure I would get into. And keep in mind, as I said earlier, most college applications cost money. So if you need to go fewer than three, that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's good. Good advice. Okay. So we did have another question about if you missed the previous webinars, are they available on demand online? And that is up on the screen for you. The YouTube channel that we have has all of our webinars. So we've done a lot of webinars on all different topics. If you go check that out, you might find some other things as well as the ones that we did in this series, the earlier ones. And then, oh, this is a good one. Someone asked, do colleges focus more on weighted GPA or unweighted GPA? Does anybody know the answer to that? You would have to look at each individual college's website to see how they do it. for the most part, they ignore that. I know that sounds crazy, but they have to compare apples to oranges because some schools are going to, some applicants will have gone to schools that weight their GPAs and others don't. Similarly, right. some applicants will have gone to schools that have class rank and others don't. So there's no way for a college to look at that, you know, one dimensionally mm-hmm. and say, oh, well, too bad. Now, a, a, um, Weighted GPA, if for those who don't know, would mean that they put more, you get more credit for taking harder classes, which I mentioned earlier. If you have a, if you still have an opportunity to take honors, AP, things like that, in a weighted GPA setting, that will raise your GPA. If you ever met somebody who had like a 4.7 GPA and you go to a school that doesn't weight their GPA, you're like, what does that even mean, right? It means they took higher level classes and did well in them and that raised their GPA up over four. Now, you're already going to be getting credit for those courses in other ways. So if you look at AP, for instance, that actually pays off three times. If it's a weighted GPA high school, it raises your GPA to get an A in that class versus an A in a, in a normal class. Second, it's possible if you took an AP class that you might get college credit for that. If you take the AP test and you, and you knock it out of the park and the college you're applying to is one that will give you college coursework credit for that, you just knocked a couple of college court credit hours out without going to college, which is really cool. And third, which I think is, is, is the most important for this question, um, they're already looking to see what, whether you challenge yourself. If you're mm-hmm. at a weighted GPA high school, they can already tell by the GPA. Mm-hmm. If you're not, they'll still understand that you did what you could. They just didn't happen to go to school that did that. So the short answer again is the Depends. college knows the difference between the two. Make, just find out you know, what the college thinks or how the college looks at it. Um, if you're not sure whether your school does weighted GPAs or does class ranks, ask your counselor. They'll immediately know. Um, and you can factor that in, but it's not going to be a big, there's nothing you can do to control that, right? So the college understands that. Great. That's awesome. Okay. I think this question is best for probably Rachel. I heard that if I go to a community college, there's a chance that some of my credits won't transfer if I go to an out-of-state school. Is that true? That is true. So unfortunately, there there is always a chance of whenever, and that's not a community college to any college thing. That is any transfer. So from any college to any other college, there's always going to be the risk of credits not transferring or of courses being found to be inapplicable or not up to the standards of the 
incoming college. The thing that you can do to mitigate that is to contact the college that you'd like to transfer to and say, this is where I'm planning on starting. This is what I'm planning on taking. Do you have any advice for me? So let's mm. say you already know this is the four-year college that I'm aiming for, but I need to start at community. Call the college admissions department. Tell them for X, Y, Z reasons, I'm going to start at community college. Which courses should I take to ensure that all my credits will transfer? Now, if you get an associate's degree, that changes dramatically. So once you're transferring your credits in as a, as a full degree, there is much higher likelihood of everything being accepted. Because usually what they'll do is they'll just take, for example, if you get a, an associate's degree in psychology, now you're going for a bachelor's degree in psychology they'll most likely just take that full 60 credit associate degree and apply it toward your your base courses in your bachelor's degree mm. or they'll apply some to electives or some to whatever <clears throat> so it does vary from college to college but the the best thing that you can do is to just pre-plan so contact the college that you plan to go to in the future if you already know what that one is and say, this is what I wanna do, can you help me out? What should I take? What should I stay away from? The other thing you can do if you don't know what college you're planning on going to is change colleges depending upon what they're willing to accept. Mm. You know, I actually applied for a different university and they had all kinds of pickiness about some of my previous credits that they did or didn't want to accept. And I said, okay, you know what? I'm good. Thanks. And I found a college that accepted pretty much a hundred percent of my credits. So there are different options. There's always, there's always wiggle room and there's always room to negotiate, but so yeah, it is, it is a possibility, but there's plenty that you can do to mitigate that. That's good advice. Okay. We are just about out of time. We have one more really quick question for you, Rachel. I think your answer will be short. I really like sports. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> I really like Sorry. sports. And even though I'm probably not going into a sports field, is it okay if I take a lot of PE classes in college? It is always okay to take any classes that interest you in college because education for its own sake is a wonderful, incredible luxury that we have and it's a blessing. But keep in mind that dependent upon your major, dependent upon whether or not you ever plan to transfer, those credits may or may not help you toward your degree or future degrees. Mm. So just keep that in the back of your mind. But I would introduce another possibility, which is to take PE category courses that have additional merit. So for example, ah. huge, huge industry right now, health and nutrition humongous yes. part of PE, humongous part of the sports field, humongous part of the nutrition field, which is like a new burgeoning thing. So things like that, go ahead and take the course syllabus and Google the course and its syllabus and see what career paths it might apply to. You can always find out how a course is going to help you later on down the line with just a simple internet search. So if you look up a course and it's, you know, underwater basket weaving and there are just really no career projections for that, you can say to yourself, okay, do I really want to learn about underwater basket weaving? Is it the most important thing for me to learn? Or would I perhaps be really interested in a nutrition course that has all of these different fields that I can apply that in? So those are the things to consider when taking those courses. I will never tell you, don't take a class because learn everything you can. All, mm -hmm. the, all the information is good information. But if you want to keep it on a career trajectory, try to find things that have some sort of niche in the professional world. Great advice. All right. Well, our time's up. We went all the way to the end of the hour. Thank you so much, Henry and Rachel. Thank you to our audience. Love the questions. Appreciate that you, were, that you all sent them in. And we hope you have a great day. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.